Ross Terrell, how does a country boy from Gippsland in Victoria come to be a citizen both of Australia and America with a personal and professional obsession with China? Well, in, in uh, East Gippsland, my first girlfriend was a Chinese. Uh, I didn't know she was Chinese. Kids are not conscious of race. It's a very happy trait. But later on, I, I found that she was the ancestor of people who'd come for gold to Victoria. So 19th gold. century. Uh, yeah, she was half Chinese. Mm. And uh, that had nothing to do with me being interested in China or writing books. I think the upbringing in, in East Gippsland uh, amidst nature, I think it made me an observer. My dad would drive us here and down to Lake's entrance to the beach and I would, would keep a diary on everything we did. So I was always interested. I, mean, I had a curiosity about, at first, nature. And you have to, because uh, if that's a brown snake or a black snake, you have to know the difference. And pocket money for my brother and I was picking beans uh, uh, in the heat. It was terrible work. And we're paid by the bag, and it seemed to take forever to fill a bag, and then catching rabbits for the furs, which we'd take into the, the town and sell them, and uh, my mother would cook the rabbits. Writing, so, writing is a tough job, but it's not as tough as picking beans or doing, <laughs> doing rabbits. But I, I always uh, uh, was interested in observing. I had a, a streak of, of curiosity. I was the youngest child, and I think a bit badly behaved sometimes, and not one for the rule book, maybe. And all these traits came into play later. I had, I've had a, a rather independent uh, approach, and I've never worked for uh, a government. And I did uh, have to push uh, for my first trip to, to China. Uh, it was forbidden fruit, and uh, I was wandering around uh, Europe, actually, and I thought, why, why can't I go to China? We're selling wheat to China, after all, though there was no relation between Australia and China diplomatically. So I went to embassies in East Europe, Chinese embassies. There were none in West Europe. And I'd go in Prague, and they'd say, oh, we'll send your application to to uh, Peking, as they called it then. By the time there was an answer, if there was an answer, I'd moved on to Budapest and the same thing there. And in Warsaw, being very young, 20, early 20s, I, uh, I went and said, apparently you don't want a young Australian to know anything about your country. Uh, it's a pity. And the Chinese diplomat said, wait a moment, and another more senior person came in. The result was next morning the phone rang in my little hotel, said your Chinese visa is waiting. So I was persistent and, and I pushed and flew on a little uh, turboprop, turboprop jet, Moscow, Omsk, Tomsk, Irkutsk, and you see Europe turning into Asia the Mongolian desert comes into view, and Lake Baikal, the hills of Beijing. That was 1964. And uh, actually, Rupert Murdoch had just founded The Australian. And I wrote six articles on my trip and sent it off from Melbourne. The newspaper was then edited in Canberra. Rupert edited it, changed the words himself. Uh, this is about February 1965 they were published. And what sort of forbidden fruit was China in 1964? Well, you had, to get, you had to get permission from the Australian government to go. And when, but when you actually set foot there? Controlled. And you didn't know uh, what you didn't know. 
and I didn't know a word of Chinese then. So it was very preliminary. You had to be met at the airport. Any time you left your hotel room, your, your guardian uh, either came with you or wanted to know exactly where you were going. I remember asking to see a, a Christian pastor because I was a Christian and uh, oh, this was a big uh, brouhaha. But finally they found one, but they made sure that they took me there and uh, maybe they chose the, the suitable pastor. So uh, un, unsupervised visits to China were, were quite impossible. And however, the trip was fuel for, for my determination to, to taste the forbidden fruit, to, to understand this country. You have to remember there wasn't a single resident Australian or American diplomat, journalist or businessman in Beijing at that time. There was one air, foreign airline flying into China. It was the one I took Aeroflot from Moscow. And uh, the, the, but the, the feeling when I got back to Australia and to, to the credit of my teachers uh, at the University of Melbourne, they, they, they did encourage me and then I studied with uh, Jack Gregory in the history department. But the study of China then was a study of the, the Western impact on China. British, it, British on the coast. And I mean, that was the, that was the times that uh, what, we, what we knew, what we were taught about it was mainly what the, the British and others were trying to do and the response of the Chinese. And that is, I think, how your professional experience mirrors in some ways much of what has happened to Australia geopolitically and geoeconomically over your life. You start off as a young, as a young bloke with growing up with it, that sort of intimate view of Britain, that idea of Australia being tied to Britain. And as you develop, um, your Australianness finds its expression in other countries. It, it fi you find yourself spending much of your life in the United States, uh, an attachment to the US, but also a life immersed in China. And that, to me, seems to say something about the way that the Australian trajectory has moved it also. Well, in those days, uh, in our universities, people, you had to go overseas, as it was put. You were incomplete until you went uh, abroad, and then if you did go abroad, you were finished, or you <laughs> you were you, finished you, in Australia left. because left. Australia didn't like people to 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 go and not come back. The idea that the 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 important thing in the word expatriate is ex that that you had rejected Australia. Of course, it's not so simple as that at all. I I simply won a scholarship to to Harvard called the Frank Knox Scholarship, offered every year to someone from the British Commonwealth. And I sent a letter from the University of Melbourne and uh, I won it. So that's, that's why I went to America. Why did I stay? Well, I think uh, the liberty of America and the dynamism of America attracted me. Melbourne was a more uh, constricted, world then in terms of private life. And w we were frustrated. Uh, Premier Henry Bolte banned so many books. We couldn't read Lolita, we couldn't read Catcher in the Rye. And the more they were banned, the more curious we were about what was in these books. Well, in America, there, there wasn't that kind of uh, constraint. And, and later, it, there wasn't in Australia either. And the dynamism of America was very good to me. It's a, for, for writing books in the English language, of course, New York was the, was the mecca. And as a writer, you took on 
one of the foundational Australian texts in terms of Australia's relationship with the region, uh, Donald Horne's Lucky Country, and you did two editions of The Australians. And Horne's line in 1964 was that Australia is a lucky country run mainly by second-rate people who share its luck. But in The Australians coming at the same turf and the sa tracking over the same country, Three, three decades later, you were much more optimistic about how Australia was doing and you, you pointed to things like um, Australia's willingness to change and the, the strength of its institutions and you weren't too hard on Australia's leaders and their ability to change. Well, I, I shouldn't be too hard because it's a, it's a success story and the things that used to, to worry us uh, worry us much less. Actually, there are still things we worry about that we shouldn't. Last week, in the last week or so at Aspie, we've had both the Norwegian ambassador and the Swedish ambassador come and chat with us. And they, they both give the impression that they think Australia doesn't know that it's a lucky country. That's not the we word they use. We don't believe our luck anymore. Because they, they look at the map and they say, you've got a continent to yourself and you've got all these anxieties about security and uh, we, we don't have a continent to ourselves we've got nations all around us and the Swedish ambassador said look the distance from Stockholm to Beijing uh, is uh, less than the distance from Beijing to, to Sydney which is correct the, fl the flying time but uh, we, we felt that, that history and geography were pulling us in uh, different directions. And as late as the Prime Ministership of Paul Keating, that was, that was the worry. I think the, the years after that, the years of Howard, there was a real uh, reconciliation of the two, not only through government policy, but through social change. And uh, Australians were travelling in, in Asia, Australian business took off with China and by the end of, of that long period of, of Howard and Downer, Australia had very good relations with, with China, with India, with Japan and Indonesia and they had kept the, the American alliance. So when we were students in University of Melbourne, we were told you couldn't do both of these things. Well, Australia has done both of these things. Is that why Australia is less conflicted about its place and where it's going than it was, say, in the 50s and 60s, that Australia is more comfortable with its own capacities? Well, we've done a lot of things. We've taken the initiative under, under the Labor government, Gareth Evans, as foreign minister on the Cambodian question. He took the initiative. Howard took an initiative on East Timor and twisted uh, President Clinton's arm. American muscle power came into the picture and East Timor came into existence. Those kind of initiatives uh, were beyond our reach in, in the 60s, and they were thought to be beyond our reach uh, even, even later than that. Now, are we still torn? Well, of course, every, every country is, is torn. You're torn between uh, preparedness for possible war and the desire for peace, but that's, that's the nature of, of social existence. And the, the Americans are torn between their economic uh, relation with China and their uh, apprehension that China might be seeking to push them aside in Asia Pacific. The, the, the cultural, the immigration issue is also a, a, a fraught one for many countries that have had major uh, immigration, especially from, from the Arab world, the Muslim world. And in this respect, uh, Australia's isolation puts it in a different and maybe happier position than, say, 
France and uh, the Netherlands, which have got a, a large uh, population of Muslim immigrants, and they haven't worked out how, how to deal with this. Now, uh, people come to Australia, in my opinion, because they, they have a wonderful image of Australia. Sometimes it's for, for, for nature, the very thing that shaped my boyhood. The Japanese love the penguins and everyone wants to go to Ayers Rock and the birds. But there's a serious point behind this because we are a comfortable place and we have room and opportunity and jobs for immigrants. On the other hand, we are very wise to, uh, uh, to control the situation. Immigration is an important aspect of Australia's future, but not uh, willy-nilly. You have to keep it steady so that the social change is not uh, so dramatic as to, you say, torn. Well, it's okay to feel tension, but it's not okay to feel tension to the point of fractiousness. You argue that Australia will continue shifting into Asia's orbit, but that the Asia effect will never be total. And I think you, you offer a very good or an intriguing Japanese analogy. You, you argue that as Japan is the most Asian nation of the West, Australia will be the most Western nation of Asia. How Asia will that be for Australia? It depends whether we want to be 50 million people or whether we want to put the brakes on. And uh, there's different opinions of, on this in both parties. Uh, Kim Beasley has spoken up for the 50 million mark. Bob Carr, our foreign minister now, when he was Premier of New South Wales, he felt we had too many people in Australia already. And they are both in the Labor Party. So that's a, that's a big choice for Australia. I mean, in Indonesia, we, we worry about China and we, we look with awe at China's progress. But Indonesia is doing well at the moment and Indonesia is very close. And if Indonesia uh, gets stronger and stronger and gets rich, then the question of, of how big Australia is and how prosperous it is and how many people it has will be an important uh, national security issue. There are people thinking about this for the future, but I, I don't know whether ordinary Australians uh, think very much about it. And do you think ordinary Australians have turned their minds to what sort of country Australia will be in Asia or how Asian Australia might become? Well, it's, uh, it's an unwitting process and I think it's good that it be an unwitting process. I mean, the business will go where the markets are. Uh, as tourists, we, we go to places that intrigue us. And for Australia, Asia is within reach but many people still want to go to New York or they want to go to, to London. I don't think to, to a trenchant degree we have to plan this, this future of how Asian Australia is. I, I tend to a, a, agree with the, the position of Mr. Downer when he was foreign minister. He used to tell the Chinese, we, we, we're not uh, going to be the same as you. We've got our own friends and you've got your own friends, but we, we can do business and we can respect each other. So I don't think it's a process of Asianization. And I think if uh, you talk to people from Malaysia or Hong Kong who emigrate to Australia, they're not, they're not uh, coming here because it's a multicultural place. They're coming here because it's Australia. And in the Republican referendum uh, some years back, it surprised the pundits that a lot of these people voted to, 
to keep the monarchy. And I interviewed some people from Hong Kong and they were used to the idea that <laughs> the Queen of England was there in the background in Hong Kong and uh, they thought it was quite nice that she was in the background for Australia. Now that doesn't resolve the question whether it's going to be good for us in the future, but the point is Australia is what it is. In my upbringing, the, our grandparents used to talk about Britain as home. Well, uh, no one does that any longer. But the British institutions that are the strength of Australian life, British-based institutions, they, they are there and they shape the life of every Australian every day. As you turn your eyes to where we are today, what is your answer to the question you posed a decade ago? Is Asia waiting for an enemy to emerge or is Asia learning to live without an enemy? Well, since I wrote that in The Australians, uh, the world has, has changed and we've got uh, globalisation and uh, we've got the rise of, of uh, jihadism. So we have, a, um, we've had since 9-11 in the United States a different uh, perception of, of the enemy. When I wrote that, I was asking the question, would anyone replace the Soviet Union as uh, the, the preoccupation of the United States and its allies uh, like Australia and And that Japan. is, of course, the question that many in Asia are now asking as they turn their eyes to, uh, to China. Yes, I don't think China is, is, uh, is looming at the moment as a new enemy. And uh, you talked, Graham, about Australia being torn. I think that was Sam Huntington's vision of us too, Australia torn. But China is uh, torn for its future between Chinese nationalism on the one hand and this force of globalization. Globalization, symbolized by them going into the WTO, has been terribly important for, for China. And the fact that, that America takes uh, about a quarter of China's exports, a market that wouldn't be easily replicated if that market were not there. Uh, China is in the, in the sinews of globalization and its progress and its prosperity, prosperity of urban China is linked to these interdependencies in the world. On the other hand, there's Chinese uh, nationalism. And we see it in action at the moment to, toward Japan in the Senkaku Islands, and it's a force to be, to be reckoned with. And Australia has also a, a tension between thinking about China in, in economic terms, where it's a bonanza, and the wariness that uh, uh, China is, is getting militarily very powerful, has got an uh, important naval uh, power that it didn't have when I wrote the, the Australians and it's now a presence in the in the Indian Ocean as well as in the East China Sea and the South uh, China Sea. But when you ask the question Graham now, or you ask it or I would ask it about enemies, we have to say that the the globalization forces uh, may mean that no one will uh, be a number one in the old sense. Now America was a number one after 1945 in a very clear cut fashion with Japan in ashes, Germany uh, prostrate and then when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, America uh, stood astride the world in power terms. Now it may be that there, 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 there won't be such a situation 
in the future. I don't think America's declining very fast and <laughs> I think it's going to be a superpower for quite a long time to come. And it, there's no vacancy for a replacement at the moment. And the Chinese, uh, they are rather rational. It's an authoritarian government, but it's a rational one. And they, they will seek uh, a leading role, but they seek it by, by opportunity. They're not, not going to just grab this and, and grab that. So we, we may see balances and uh, uh, I hope equilibriums. Equilibrium is a, is a great force for peace. It's not as dramatic as disarmament or empires, but uh, it allows breathing room for smaller countries and breathing room for people to get on with their lives. And if we had an equilibrium between uh, China and the United States, I don't think we would need to talk anymore about, talk for the time being about enemies or who is number one. The big China question. Do you still believe that China's communist regime will pass away just as the Soviet Union collapsed or just as Suharto's regime fell in Indonesia. Is that still your belief? Yes, I do. Why? Well, in Chinese history, we've had all these dynasties and uh, in a way, the, the communist one is a dynasty and it had its great founder, uh, Mao Zedong. And uh, then they buried him uh, they buried his ideas without uh, saying they were rejecting him, but Maoism is a thing of the past. And the, the ideas with which China has reformed and made progress are essentially uh, those of, of the free market, of the open door expressed in joining the, the WTO, and uh, this is not uh, compatible with the, the rule of a communist party. Now, what does a communist party do when it has a monopoly of the power? It allocates resources and uh, it uh, demarcates the, the philosophic space what you can do and what you can't do. The Communist Party is, is not allocating resources. The market is doing a great deal of that in China. And uh, currently, the, the power of the social media in China is expressing the fact that the, the mental realm is being disputed. And uh, you say that the, the you quote me as saying the communism will pass away. You, you've only got to go to Beijing, you talk to young people and not so young people in the Communist Party. They think the same thing. So it's, it's a question of what's the, the nature of the transition. There's got to be a political pluralism. Now that's what they don't have now and how you reconcile a new economy and a new society with uh, uh, an authoritarian politics. That's the thing that every member of the standing committee of the Chinese Politburo, they, they think about and probably dream about every day. Now, because the Soviet Union collapsed doesn't mean that the Chinese will collapse. China's always been very different from the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union never got prosperous while it was still the Soviet Union. China has got prosperous while still being a communist party. So they will pioneer uh, a, a different path. Whether they ultimately change the name of the communist party to the, the the National Party of China, or whether they uh, enhance the role of the existing uh, quasi-parliament 
parliamentary institutions to permit uh, competition. All, all this will, will be done in a Chinese fashion. So is your money on an evolution, a slow evolution, or is it on some great crisis, some collapse? 50-50, because the, the, uh, the realm of China is a huge challenge for governance. One third of China territorially was historically not Chinese. It was Mongols, it was Turkic peoples or Tibetan peoples. And uh, it is still a semi-empire. Uh, Mao inherited the, the Qing dynasty borders of China and the Qing dynasty borders of China, it was double the size of the Ming dynasty, the previous dynasty. So control and governance of this 1.4 billion people with the large part of the territory being not Han Chinese it's such a challenge, and the Chinese government knows it's such a challenge, that you can't rule out that an economic slowdown and a political dispute in, in China over whether to move to political pluralism would cause a, a, a crisis. You can't. There are many Chinese intellectuals who say that un, unless Xi Jinping, the new leader, becoming uh, president of China this month, that unless he does take political steps toward political liberalisation, it makes the prospect of a future crisis greater. The two great issues confronting any dynasty, the succession issue and the legitimacy issue, the party seems to be handling the succession issue reasonably well. How well are they hanging on to legitimacy? Well, that's a very good question, and it's one that the Prime Minister of Japan addressed a week or two ago in, in Washington, uh, in an interview with the Washington Post. And he said the, the aim of uh, socialism is to create equality, and uh, China can't get legitimacy anymore from that aim because they've gone in the direction of the markets and uh, he didn't say so, but China is not an equal society. It's one of the most unequal in the world, actually. So the Prime Minister of Japan said they replaced that uh, legitimacy through establishing socialism with two things. They promised the people uh, a high rate of economic growth and uh, Chinese nationalism. And he, he said that because he feels Japan is feeling the brunt of the, of the second point in the Senkaku Islands and the Philippines and Vietnam uh, see the same thing in, in the South China Sea. Now, the really important point in your question is about the rate of economic growth, because if that continues, then uh, the ship will probably be steady and uh, the Chinese nationalism may well be uh, kept within bounds. If, if the rate of growth stalls in, in a big fashion, then the whole, the whole politics of, of China will be challenged. Ross Terrell, let's finish where we started. Let's finish this by asking you one of the most complicated questions you can ask any man. How has China and your experience of China and your, your lifetime of thinking about China, how has it formed you and formed your life? It's a great laboratory of the, of the human experience and I didn't know anything about it and there I, as a young man, I discovered it, and ever since I've thought, you know, that this is, uh, <clears throat> well, it was then nearly a quarter of the world's population, it's still more than a fifth, and they're almost uh, everything that, that we are not. They are old and we are new, they are huge in population and 
and we are small. They're very uh, family-oriented. They're not as individualistic as Australians and, uh, and Americans. But there is a, a fascination in uh, confronting difference. Just as learning a, another language teaches you a great deal about your, your own language. And China is, is a mirror, actually sometimes it's a, a problem that China is a mirror because people are not discovering China, they're discovering themselves. But that's, uh, that's part of the cross-cultural process. But starting points can be very uh, partial. Nixon's starting point with China was to get leverage against the Soviet Union. And Kissinger, my former teacher, his starting point uh, was getting the Vietnam War ended and smothering the failure of Vietnam with peace uh, with China. Whitlam, with whom I went to China in 1971, he had a lawyer's a rational view that the world should be everyone at the table and he wanted China, North Korea and North Vietnam brought into it all. My teacher at Harvard Fairbank, for him he, he wanted access to, to Chinese materials and Chinese classrooms. So we all have our starting points and then we have to let the starting points interact with the reality we find. Ross Tyrrell, it has been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Graham.